nurse and says, I am with this on evil. I know I have this disorder. You should be giving me this medication. Maybe I'll have this side effect, etc., etc. We have compulsions. Gaming, trading of stocks, and actual gambling itself. Every year, I and a number of my colleagues are faced with kids who are sent back, usually from American universities. Why? Because they do not make the grade in terms of attendance. And unlike in Indian universities where outstanding students actually refers to students who stand outside the class, over there, the kids are sent back if they have inadequate attendance. And nine times out of ten, inadequate attendance actually refers is, is the, I mean the cause of, in, of inadequate attendance is actually that kids are spending all their time either gaming or doing some kind of stuff on the net, sleeping very late, not getting up adequately in time for the class, and things like that. So it's becoming a major issue over there. Every year kids are being sent back, and now unfortunately we are even seeing it in our city. The cyber sex addiction. Once again, an enormously difficult problem. And speaking as a psychiatrist, we see this all the time. I guess when we were young, we were also interested in the opposite sex. At that time, a Playboy magazine was something incredible. Now, of course, this Playboy is the first lady in America. Wonderful. <laughs> we used to try to get blue movies very difficult to procure. Today, at the switch of a button, you can see whatever you want to see. And sometimes we laugh at the fact that the Indian government recently attempted to block a lot of porn sites. So they actually sent out, I mean it was viral on my uh, WhatsApp groups, a whole bunch of uh, sites which had been blocked down. So if I knew the names of about five or six, I was gratified now to know the names of about 500. Stupidity at its acne, stupidity at its peak. We are all fairly adjusted people, we are all fairly stable. But when you have a kid who is in the throes of his adolescence, his hormones going haywire, he doesn't really know the difference between what is normal or so-called normal sex and what cyber sex shows. When he sees men with huge penises, when he sees women doing the most amazing things sexually, and if the Lord forbid he considers that to be normal, it cannot be a good potent for the future in terms of a stable relationship. Not surprisingly then, he lands up having major issues related to having a good relationship with his wife. A lot of men come up to me and say, but isn't porn normal? And I say, of course it is. It's normal. But it's the extent to which you do porn which is unknown. In our still fairly cloistered societies, where it is still not absolutely okay to have multiple uh, girlfriends or boyfriends, where you still have lawyers and other people from political parties coming out with the most abhorrent things related to women and their sexuality, it is still a problem. And then, if the only access that you have to sexuality comes from a screen, and it is so easily acceptable, it is so easily, uh, you know, you can get it, accessible, it becomes a real issue. There's also a very well-known connection now, and we've seen it happening in all our research papers when we attend for other specialities in psychiatry. A number of men land up having problems in sexual activity with their other person in their lives. And it seems to be related to anxiety, related to either the size of their own genitals or how they are performing. Because what you're seeing on screen obviously is something that is photoshopped usually, while what you're actually got is certainly not like that. The other hassle that we see is with our kids. Now our kids are always on the net. Very often they use it for academics. But very often, even in the process of using it for academics, they land up getting onto sites which are best avoided. I had a kid and, you know, I've been a consultant to a number of schools, both dealing with normal children and special kids and classic society, <coughs> and universities dealing with special education and so on. That's the only way you really get some knowledge and some practical experience. 
So I remember how a kid came up to me, he must have been in the seventh or eighth standard, and he was tackling away, and he said, Doc, do you know what I did yesterday? I said, what? He said, I had a lecture, I mean, I had to do some stuff on, on uh, reptiles. So I was thinking of reptiles, and I said, I'll do something on snakes. So I tapped in black snakes, and guess what I got? So I said, I don't want to know, I know what you're going to say. He insisted on describing it in graphic detail. If this kind of thing is so easily available in spite of all our net nannies and our attempts to reduce kids' uh, dependence on the net, it's becoming a major issue. As a corollary to that, we have something called cyber relationship addiction, where you're actually having a relationship with somebody on the other side of the net who you've never actually, off the screen, who you've actually never seen. And today, I happen to be on our family service centers, uh, one of the counselors which has been appointed also, where we are dealing with kids who are faced, who are having horrible custody patterns and things like that. One of the things that we are now seeing in our divorce cases is actually cyber relationship issues, where the wife or the husband just cannot take it that the spouse is in a virtual relationship with somebody who he or she is probably never going to be visit, hopefully, probably never going to meet, but they're still having a so-called relationship. It's becoming a major problem. Is it an addiction? What causes it then? There are lots of theories about it, nobody really knows. But like with all addictions that we see in all spheres, whether it's cigarettes or alcohol or drugs, or exercise or eating, the general thing is that we feel that the person is probably very stressed, depressed, and lonely. And in the process of getting over his depression, <coughs> in the attempt to getting over being lonely, he lands up trying to get a connection with somebody. In the process of getting a connection with somebody, he lands up liking it so much that he does it more and more. That's one possibility. The other, he is genuinely interested in finding out about other people, about other things, more information. And in the process of doing so, he figures out that the normal problems that he would face if he were out in the actual world and interacting with people and dealing with things, no longer is there. He's a nice little cocoon. Nobody is there to shout and scream at him if he's alone. Nobody is there to tell him that he's an ass, that he's not cut his hair, that he's not trimmed his nails, etc., etc. What could be better than being stuck at the screen? It's totally under his control, so he thinks. Is there an actual addictive personality? Nobody really knows. They haven't really found the gene for an addictive personality. While there are some phenotypes which are supposed to have been there, nobody really knows that for sure. And of course, if a person is very introverted, very shy, has social anxiety, finds it difficult to get along with people, find it difficult to talk in front of an audience. What could be better than just looking at a screen? That person is not going to make faces at you and sigh with relief when you stop talking and look at you and so on and so forth. So it becomes something that reduces his overall anxiety and he lands up doing it more and more. A lot of kids would say this is nonsense. It's not a problem. It's just a, just a generational bias. The older people never had it, and now that we have it, they can't take it, so they say that we are addicted. Actually, we are not, it's they who are stupid. Is that really true? But we must realize that social media is addictive. Like I've said before, it serves to relieve distraction and boredom. And when you're on the net, when you're on Facebook, for example, when you're posting comments, Likes and comments are positive reinforcements for posting anything. And anything that's a positive reinforcement is extremely difficult to stop. If I walk in, in, a, in, a, in a school and I'm talking and I see rapt attention, it's wonderful. It's a positive reinforcement and I keep doing it more and more. If a kid has not normally done homework and he does homework and the teacher claps for him and calls him a great guy. It's a positive reinforcement. He's going to do it more and more. Positive reinforcements are extremely difficult to stop.
It allows comparison of our lives with others. And this is sometimes the negative aspect. It can cause a decline of self-confidence. You're looking around you and you find people seeming to have a wonderful time. You look at Instagram and they're seeming to be at the most exotic places. And you wonder what's wrong with you? What's wrong with your life? Am I not good enough? It does lead to a decline of self-confidence. And given that, it often makes us restless. There's this whole bunch of research papers that talks about how media can glamorize drugs and alcohol and as a corollary to that, how it can actually reduce or desensitize our abhorrence towards violence 